deepest oceans to the peaks of the world's highest mountains. Get ready for an adventure into the wonder and excitement that is our planet. This week, we're crossing a river filled with hippos and crocodiles who aren't all that thrilled that we're there. Then, we're racing up and down Mount Rainier in record time. And finally, illegally sneaking across the border and then traveling through the Sonoran Desert. This is National Geographic Weekend. Welcome back. This is National Geographic Weekend. I'm Boyd Matson. Uh, we're learning all kinds of things at National Geographic these, uh, this particular week because we've got a lot of our uh, new emerging explorers uh, at National Geographic. A lot of them are stopping by our radio show, and they're telling us all kinds of things that the research they're doing. So it's some tips that you might find useful. Here's the newest tip I'll just share with you. If you're ever in the Akavanga Delta and you're hungry, you can eat the water lily bulbs. And I only know this because Steve Boyce is working uh, in Botswana trying to protect that whole Akavega Delta region and the river that flows into it that supplies it all the way back to the source, which is in Angola. In Angola. I welcome to the show, Steve, again. Great to be on the show, boy. And you do an experiment of walking across the Akavanga Delta, and you take tourists on this too? No, we don't. Uh, it's just is... people who are prepared to rough it. Absolutely. It's researchers and volunteers. I think we have lots of volunteers, obviously, that want to join us. Uh, and we don't walk. We take dugout canoes uh, across the Okavanga. It's about 220 miles. It takes us 18 days. Last year, we accessed an area that we believe has not been seen by people for 60 years. Um, and why is that? There was a blockage in the Jabora Channel, and as a result, there was an aggregation of hippo there that is just impenetrable by any, any means. Impenetrable um, hippo. Absolutely. Hundreds upon hundreds of them in your way. And, and, and they moved out? The hippos are still there. Uh, we go to a small village called Jadibe. It's the cultural home of the Bayei people. They're the river bushmen. Uh, they're our mentors. But those guys, uh, there's one of them called Momet or Co- uh, Comet or Mombo. Uh, he's 80 years old. And he's the only man living that knows the way into this wilderness. Wow. And you get him to lead you, and he knows the way around or through or under or over the hippos. Uh, I, I can only call it a purification by pain. Uh, <laughs> uh, he knows the way through it, I suppose. Through uh, it. And now you're going and you're trying to live off of what the river provides so you don't take food for 18 days. You pick it up as you go, and part of what you pick up, water lily bulbs. Yes, we, we, we take nine days of rice and beans uh, and oats. Uh, Rice and beans and oats. That's all we have. And then we Sounds like you're feeding the horses, but... Uh. Healthy food, um, <laughs> lots of roughage, but then we will catch fish and smoke them. They will last three or four days. Um, we then catch, find the water lily bulbs kicked up by hippos and elephants because we can't dive under there to get them. Why? Because of the crocodiles. Um, they're very, very big, five, six meters in length. We see them often. In 2010, on my expedition with just myself and a French filmmaker, he was knocked out of the Makoro by a crocodile's tail. That's a dugout canoe, the Makoro. Yes, a dugout canoe. Um, and he was left hanging onto the reeds, and I had to go back and fetch him. The tail of the crocodile hit the canoe and flipped him out turned it sideways, and then the croc didn't come after him? No, no, it was on its way. It was a very narrow channel, and the croc was turning a corner, and it just flicked its tail up and kicked him out of the Makoro. And probably didn't realize he had fallen in? Or? Didn't realize, no. Um, the crocodiles in legend are meant to be able to knock people out of these Makoros. If that happens, what you have to do is swim down to the bottom, hold on to the reeds, and crawl your way up, because the crocodile is looking up for you, flailing on the surface. If you go down, it's a lot safer. And did the guy do that? No, no. He he was holding on to reeds, and luckily I managed to get back to to put him back into the the dugout. So he was hanging on at the surface. And they do look up. It's kind of like a shark looking up at the surface to see something swimming up top to go and grab. Absolutely. And we have to be very sensitive in those areas. Friends of mine have tried to take canoes, like a normal kayak, tandem kayaks. Now, a big crocodile lying on the bottom looking up uh, will see that as another crocodile. And no one has made it past Jadibe uh, because the crocs attack their boats. And this is the river you're going through. Yes. In uh, the delta you're going through. Yes. Filled with crocodiles, filled with hippos. 
And then they, as they go through there and kick up, in fact, we've put up some video recently of a story we did about the elephants in this area eating the water lilies. And they yank them up, and then the bulbs get knocked off. And what they're through. doing is the you'll see these corkscrew stems to the water lily. It's dragging the, the bulb or the flower down under. That means it's been pollinated and it's got seeds in there. The seeds I, I liken to – taste like couscous. Um, and we also go after that. That's what the elephants are after. By the way, we're talking with Steve Boyce, who is – leading the effort to get this area protected so it doesn't get destroyed and protecting the river that supplies the Akavanga Delta. So when you get a water lily bulb, what do you do? Uh, do you crack it open and get the seeds out? Do you roast the seeds or you just eat them raw? The well, first thing we do is, and it's actually quite a big process, we will we'll smoke the fish the first night. Uh, the same night we will be boiling the cleaned water lily bulbs. It's like a tuba. It's almost like a potato. Uh, we will do that for a whole night. And then the next day, we put the both together with the water lily seeds. Now, the three of them together will go for another day um, of cooking. So it takes us two days. And this food will last three or four days out of the pot. It's a, it's a super, super food. I mean, it will really keep you going on expedition. It's breakfast, lunch, and dinner um, when we have it. And you go with this one guy who knows the way through the hippos. The hippos are still there. Yes, they are. Um, Did you get pictures of these hippos? Did you? Absolutely. absolutely. So you saw them. You came upon them. We have filmed uh, us going past them. Uh, People cannot go past these hippos in boats. Boats upset them, motorboats. Uh, We go silently past them. We will uh, give them a wide berth. Uh, We do it the way of the Baye River Bushmen. Uh, We are extremely sensitive in the way in in which we approach that wilderness. Uh, We are unarmed, which makes us a lot more careful. I I believe... uh, a modern person with a rifle is uh, just blunders through the wilderness, endangering the animals around them. Uh, we are very sensitive. We will only carry spears when we're walking on the islands. The Bayei men, by the way, will not go to Chief's Island, which is pretty much the place we, we're aiming to get to. Uh, they believe that if you snore at night, you will be killed by a lion or eaten by a lion. So it's just a big risk they're not willing to take. If we take them onto these islands, they will stay awake all night around the fire. <laughs> but I'm curious now about going around the hippos because hippos go underwater. A lot of times you don't see where they are. And they are known, well, frankly, they're responsible for more deaths than any other of the animals in Africa because they'll flip the canoes. They might take one bite or they knock you out and then the crocodiles get you. I've seen them uh, take a person. It is a massive thing that's in our minds. But what was the situation? It was a it was a show being made. The host was getting closer and closer on a makoro. We had advised that person not to go anywhere near this injured hippo, a young male. Uh, the production team decided to go for it. And um, when she was five meters away, the, the hippo went for her. The uh, injured hippo? Yeah. Um, she uh, went straight through her knee and her calf. Um, the two chops. The first one had folded the makoro. The production people went off the back. Uh, it was a, a, a terrible thing to see and to experience afterwards trying to, to get her stabilized and onto a helicopter. Um, but we do not take risks like that. We would never do anything like that. And you got her out? We did, yes. Um, she I'd, had a tusk, uh, one of those big teeth, yes. go through the leg. Which are sharpened onto each other, so they're like a razor blade. Um, yeah, yeah, straight yeah. And through, all those like hippo teeth. Yeah, this, it's, it's like on a 45-degree angle on the, on the tooth because it's rubbed against the other one. So it's, a, and, it's and like a scraper that the, they traditionally made to scrape hides with. Yeah. We flew the production team out that day. Uh, we confiscated their, their, um, their film. Um, I had that earlier that day found one of the production team in a wetsuit with a waterproof camera stalking into a pod of 15 hippos. And I just arrived at that time to stop them and tell them that we were going to film at the other place, at uh, the place where this accident happened. So that could have happened twice in that same day. Um, And those are not risks that we're willing to to allow to happen. Now, you have to be very careful around hippos. And so you take the chance, though, but but you're going silently in the canoe and trying to keep a distance from them. We've learned how to speak to the hippos through the Bayi people in their language. Um, You, To me, a hippo is is like like a big bull mastiff. It's a big strong animal but it will listen to you um as long as you maintain that interaction the tone in your voice um and just stay away from them don't go through the middle of that piece of water um give them as wide a berth as possible we're talking with steve boys one of our new national geographic emerging explorers who's doing a lot of work trying to preserve uh, the akavango delta keep it uh, this rich resource that it is in the country of Botswana in southern Africa. Uh, we've had Steve on before because he also does a lot of work with uh, parrots trying to protect those, particularly the gray parrots, which have been smuggled out of the country for uh, the pet trade and uh, have actually put a stop to – you can't bring them in now to South Africa because of work you've done. And uh, they were they were being confiscated and raised in nurseries uh, or 
they were being forced to just sort of breed and produce eggs and produce more parrots. They were taking the, the breeders and, and holding them in these dark, confined spaces, and you've tried to put a stop to that. So Steve's been doing a lot of good work and now taking it on from South Africa into Botswana. We're protecting the Akavanga Delta. Uh, stay away from the hippos. <laughs> no, I will avoid Whenever a record is broken, we say, well, that's what you expect. Records are made to be broken. Unless you're the person setting the record, you would at least expect you have a little time to enjoy your accomplishment, maybe a celebration or two. But our next guest did an amazing accomplishment of setting a speed record up and down Mount Rainier. But there's no time to celebrate. We'll tell you why when we return here on National Geographic Weekend. I'm Boyd Matson. <laughs> 